Good evening, folks. Welcome. It's good to see you out tonight. It's a pleasure to welcome back again Mr. Ryan Higgins back to the pulpit. He was here two Sunday nights ago. So, Ryan, it's really good to have you back again, and we look forward to you leading us tonight and to what you would say to us from God's Word. A uh, couple of announcements. Faith Connection, uh, if you have anybody to relay that to you, is on, on Wednesday night, half past six to a quarter past seven. And then the midweek's on uh, at eight o'clock. And uh, midweek, Wednesday night, we'll be thinking especially to you, we'll be praying for world events at the minute, along with uh, the needs of our own congregation. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Really good to see you this evening and to be back with you to worship our God who is worthy of our praise. Um, as we come to worship, we're reminded of who Jesus is and, and what he has done. And in Philippians chapter 2, we have this beautiful uh, section which, which says this. This is God's word. Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not account equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of man, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. We come to worship the Lord Jesus Christ who reigns. And no matter what we are seeing on our news, no matter what people will tell us, we know that our Lord Jesus Christ is the one who reigns. And we confess him as Lord this evening as we come to worship. And let's stand together as we sing all I want's hell dear.
Let's join together as we come in prayer. Let's pray. Lord of all, we adore you for you are utterly good. And we fear you for you are most high. We come into your presence boldly, knowing that you're most merciful and that your love surpasses all understanding. But we also come fearing you, conscious that you are to be feared. For you are all powerful and infinite and most just. We come acknowledging the the depths of our lowliness and the heights of your greatness, but we also come rejoicing, for you have entered into our lowliness through your Son. We thank you for Christ Jesus, our God and Savior. We adore him, for though He was in the form of God. He took on the form of a servant and being fully God and fully man, he humbled himself to death on a cross. He lived the perfect life we could never live and yet suffered for our mistakes, for our imperfect lives. We thank you for this fullest expression of your steadfast love. And we do confess that our sins are many but we also trust that your mercy is more. And so we plead that you be merciful according to your steadfast love. We confess that that we have not loved you as we should and that we have not loved others well. We confess that we have not honored Jesus as Lord in our day-to-day lives and we've not bowed our knee in adoration and in reverence. And so please forgive us. Please cleanse us. Please create in us clean hearts. We return to you with all of our heart. We return to you and we bow our knee in acknowledgement that Jesus' name is above every name. And we long for that day when, when your reign is clear for all to see. Right now our world can feel a little bit chaotic and out of control, but but Lord, we turn to you knowing that you are the one who reigns, who is in control, who is completely sovereign, the one who is accomplishing your good purposes even when we are when we cannot see it. You are always good and always most trustworthy. But until that day when when we see your reign so clearly, until that day when we see, when we experience the the fullness of your presence, until then, right now, as we come to worship, we confess Jesus as our Lord. And we ask that our worship would be acceptable and pleasing to you. May you help us to worship in adoration and fear Help us to honor the name of Jesus. In Christ, our Savior's name, the name that is above every name, in his name we pray. Amen. Uh, We've adored our God in, in our praise and in our prayer, and we've confessed our lowliness and and it's so good that we're assured of his welcome and forgiveness for all who return to him in, in 1 John 1 verse 9, it says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Our Lord is faithful and just and able to forgive us and cleanse us. We continue to think about God's word as we turn to Philippians chapter 1. If you have your your Bible with you, please do turn to Philippians chapter 1. and You'll find that on page 980 on your, in your pew Bible. Philippians chapter one, and we're reading from verse 27. This is God's word. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel 
and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake, engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. Amen. And we thank God for his word. Uh, We continue to worship God as we uh, stand together and sing, Oh, how good it is. Later, we're going to be thinking about how the the church should stand together fearlessly for the gospel, even in the face of opposition. And so we want to pray for God's people who are opposed. We want to pray for the persecuted church. And we also want to pray for the church in Northern Ireland that that we would stand together for the gospel. Um, And for ourselves, we want to ask that God would help us to stand fearlessly together for 
uh, the gospel. We also want to remember Ukraine. Uh, Let us join together and pray. Heavenly Father, you are the true sovereign, the everlasting to everlasting God who knows the, the beginning from the end. We adore you for you map out the span of our days. We praise you for your accomplishing your purposes in this world and you are most good and your rule is most perfect. But Lord, truthfully, we also come weary and we look across our world and our hearts ache and we long for when Jesus returns and the whole earth, including Russia and Ukraine, will be a a garden of peace and grace and love. We long for that day. But until then, uh, right now, we we turn to you for help. We ask that you would be most merciful and preserve life. We ask that you would bring peace. Hasten the the day when, when all strife and violence will be gone forever. We ask that you would grant freedom for your people to spread the gospel And we ask right now that you would help your people in Ukraine to endure, that you would give them the grace and strength, but also help them to respond to the physical and the spiritual needs of those around them. We also remember our brothers and sisters in Christ who suffer in your name. And we know you remember all of them and you know all of those who suffer. And we ask for those imprisoned in all our parts of the world, even though they remain captive like Paul, may their chains advance the gospel. May they inspire others to speak boldly about Jesus. We ask that you would comfort them. We ask that you would grant them grace to endure and to see their suffering as part of following in Christ's footsteps. And equally we ask for those who have suffered great loss. May you fill up their emptiness. May you bind up their broken hearts. And may you fill them with the hope of Jesus Christ and the resurrection. We thank you that in our country, it is safe to worship you. And we do confess our feelings as a church. We've too often been distracted and divided over insignificant matters. And so we ask that you would forgive us and that you would help us to stand together for what truly matters, the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Help your church across Ireland to together affirm what we believe. Help your church to defend the truth. Help your church to declare that Jesus' name is the name above every name. We pray that you would bless your church and that you would add to our number. We plead for this community and and we ask that you would strengthen this church's witness and may the gospel advance around us. Help this congregation to stand together. Help them not to become divided over insignificant and trivial matters, but for their unity to deepen and grow stronger. Help us to keep the gospel the main thing in our lives. We ask that you would help us to reach those around us. Help us to know what it means to stand together as your church. And help us to be fearless, knowing that that your church cannot be destroyed and that your reign can never be brought down. And so help us as we go out as we seek to proclaim Jesus is Lord and Savior of the world, all for your glory and for your name's sake. In Christ, our King and Savior's name we pray. Amen. And before we uh, turn to look at Philippians, uh, we're going to stand and sing, Come Holy Ghost.
Um, please do keep your, your Bible open at Philippians chapter 1, and we'll be thinking about verses 27 to, to 30. Um, let's pray and ask for God's help as we come to his word. Heavenly Father, we come uh, ever in need of you. We come ever in need of your grace, and we come desiring to see more of Jesus and his work on the cross for us and what he has accomplished and how we should respond. And so please help us to hear your words, help us and build us up in the name of Christ and help us to respond in a way that pleases you. In Christ our Savior's name we pray. Amen. Uh, there's certain things ingrained in our Northern Irish culture that we love. Uh, for instance, we have our own unique foods, don't we? And uh, we love, uh, for some of us, we love crisp sandwiches and apple and Mars bar sandwiches too. Uh, we love potatoes. For many, they're an essential feature in most meals. Uh, we even have our own potato bread. Uh, of course, like anywhere else, we also have our own unique slang. Instead of saying, how are you, we'll ask, what's the crack? And there's lots of things that we uh, love about our culture. Uh, but if you go all our places, you won't find some of these things. You won't find uh, crisp sandwiches. You won't find potato bread or lots of other things which are popular here. Because after all, citizens of different nations are different. According to verse 27, by our lives we're to show how good the gospel is. Paul says, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Or you might see in your footnotes, another way to translate verse 27 is to say, only behave as citizens. Citizens. Uh, Paul was writing to uh, people who lived in Philippi, which was a, a Roman colony, and therefore they enjoyed Roman citizenship. To be a citizen of Philippi was to be a citizen of Rome, living the Roman life, adopting its culture, but absent from the capital. And Paul says, in, in a way they'll understand, live as heavenly citizens. They love their Roman citizenship. They love their identity. They love being citizens of Rome. And Paul says to them, in a way they'll understand, live as heavenly citizens. Adopt a heavenly lifestyle. While absent from your capital, live as heavenly citizens proud of your heavenly citizenship. Live in a way that reflects your true citizenship. Remember, citizens of different nations are different, and citizens of heaven are different too. We should be different to the people around us. When people move to our country, they, they bring parts of their culture with them, and, and likewise, we're to live in our community bringing a certain culture that only heavenly citizens bring. And this evening we're looking at Philippians and the part we're diving into is at the beginning of a section which stretches from verse 27 through to chapter four, verse one. And in this section, Paul spells out what it means to be heavenly citizens. Paul has already spoke about defending the gospel, verse seven, the proclamation and advancement of the gospel, verse 13 onwards, and here, credit the gospel by worthy living. And today, Paul shows us the way a heavenly citizens should live when church unity is threatened and when we face opposition from outside too. Lots of pressures within the church can threaten to divide us. Lots of pressures from outside the church can threaten to make us crumble. But Paul shows us the way a heavenly citizens should respond. This should be the way we should live. Firstly, Paul says, stand together for the gospel. Stand together for the gospel. On the 11th of uh, December, 2004, over 5 million people joined hands to form a human chain. And this human chain stretched over 650 miles across Bangladesh. And it was a human chain made up of, of supporters of 14 opposition parties. And they formed this human chain in, in protest against their government. They were demanding, they were expressing their no co co confidence in their government. They were standing together for a cause. And likewise, Paul wants the church to
to stand together for a cause. He wants the church to stand together for the gospel. Verse 27, he says he wants to hear the church standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. He begins by saying, stand firm in in one spirit. He's reminding them that they don't have to create unity, but rather it's something that, that God has already accomplished. They already are one. Later in chapter four, verse one, Paul says, stand firm in in the Lord. Their unity is grounded upon Jesus. They are his and and he's the the common object of their love and affection and, and their faith. But in this passage, the same truth of their unity is expressed differently. Here when Paul says, stand firm in one spirit, he's referring to what God has already done in their life through the spirit. Namely, God through his spirit has called them to himself and gathered them into his church. He's gathered them together and now they should live out what they are. Yet sadly, in most people's mind, churches are are divided. We we more often disagree rather than affirm what we together believe. If we're honest, instead of standing with all our believers and, and joining hands across denominational lines and, and cultural lines, we, instead we too often tear each other down. We even divide over the most insignificant matters. But God has gathered us to himself and, and to each other and we're to stand together. In chapter one, Paul has already thanked the Philippians for their partnership in the gospel. They have supported him. And here he urges them to stand together with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. What is to be the main thing? The gospel of Jesus Christ. Here when Paul says they're to be striving side by side, he paints a picture for them that that would have been very familiar to them. Um, but, but of course, we're, we're not living in the same context and, and so uh, we can just scan over it and, and, and the image is lost on us. But the picture he's painting is of, a, of an advancing line of Roman soldiers. A very familiar picture to them with their long shields forming a, a wall before them as they stand side by side, striving together. These shields are are forming this strong barrier, a wall before them as they face their enemies. And his point is that that we're not to let pressures from outside the church divide us. Instead, we're to draw together in a deeper and stronger unity and we're to advance. We're to charge forward with the gospel. But too often, we retreat We're content to to play it safe. And and if we're honest, we we don't strive to advance the gospel. And yet heavenly citizens should be doing this very thing. In our neighborhoods, in our workplaces, in our schools, in our sports clubs. We're to find ways of reaching people with the good news that, that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior of the world. Even when when pressures within the church look like they could divide us. We're to keep the gospel at the forefront. It's, been, it's sad when, when churches divide over insignificant matters because when we divide it, it doesn't serve the advancement of the gospel. And surely to live as heavenly citizens means standing together for the gospel. Perhaps it begins by together supporting this church's word ministry Maybe standing together for the gospel means finding ways of of reaching your community. It might mean standing with all our churches too to together affirm what we believe rather than always debating and tearing each other down. It might mean proclaiming together that Jesus offers life to the full and that includes his teaching on sexuality and abortion and, and all our contentious issues. Jesus offers life to the full and and maybe we're to stand together and proclaim that with all our churches too. Maybe standing together for the gospel means together supporting missionaries across our world but, but also involves scattering as a church and proclaiming Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior of the world. 
Heavenly citizens, stand together for the gospel. And secondly, Paul says, don't be frightened by opposition. Don't be frightened by opposition. Uh, Donald uh, Barnhouse was a, a Presbyterian minister in America, and he once shared an experience of, uh, of his when he was ridiculed by a crowd. He, he witnessed a, a car accident involving a, a drunk driver, and immediately after the collision, a, another man in the car who was sober, he, he pushed the drunk driver aside and, and swapped places with him. And then when the policeman arrived, the, the, the sober man started to blame the other driver, saying it was all his fault. And of course, uh, Donald Barnhouse, having witnessed all of this, he stepped forward and he explained to the policeman what had happened, that, that the drunk man was driving the car and it was all his fault. The accident was his fault. And, and after the con collision, the, the sober man and pushed him aside and, and switched places with him. But as he explained what was happening, a crowd started to gather on the scene and they were outraged. And they started to, to shout at Donald Barnhouse, what business do you have interfering? Leave the police to deal with it. It's nothing to do with you. But Barnhouse, of course, he explained that, uh, that he wasn't intruding, but this was a matter of, of right and wrong. And yet still, even as he walked away, the crowd insulted him and shouted after him and they cursed at him. You see, Barnhouse believed that as Christians, we should stand for what is right and true. But he also knew and he experienced that day that sometimes the world will hate us for it. Even when we stand for what is right and true, sometimes the world will hate us for it. And when we stand for the, the gospel, when we stand for what is right and true, the world will hate us. When we stand for Jesus, we'll, we'll be opposed as some Christians experience physical persecution, others experience discrimination, some of us have experienced relational loss, and we've experienced the, the taunts and, and the mockery of, of the crowd or, or individuals in work. But Paul says, verse 28, don't be frightened by opposition. Instead, when we fearlessly stand for the gospel, Paul says, verse 28, this is a clear sign to, to them, our opponents, of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. In other words, when people oppose Jesus and, and his people, it's a sign of their impending destruction. For those of, the, of, of you who are not yet Christians, if you oppose Jesus, if you stand against him, if you oppose him and his people, his church, you will face destruction. But for those of us who are Christians, when we're opposed, it's a sign of our salvation. It's a sign that we belong to Jesus, the, the suffering one who's now been glorified. And for that reason, we should be fearless knowing that our, our opponents can't hurt us and, and knowing that God will one day save us from all opposition. It's like this at the, at the weekends, I, I play football for uh, 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 a football team back at home, a, a local amateur club. And, and in a couple of weeks time, we, we have a big uh, cup match and we're playing against a, a much better team in a much better league. And to be honest, I'm, I'm a little bit afraid of our opponents. I'm nervous. Um, it looks like it could be really bad. It looks like it's inevitable that we're going to get uh, beaten. Um, but if I was able to, to look into the future and, and know that uh, they're not able to cause us any harm, well, then I could be fearless going on to that pitch. And on a more serious note, it's like that with us. We face sometimes terrifying opponents, and we think it's going to be bad. We can be very easily scared, but we're able to look into the future and know that, that our opponents can't cause us any lasting harm. No one nor no thing can defeat the church. And so we can be fearless. We don't need to be afraid of, of reaching out to our neighbor or inviting a friend to church. We shouldn't be afraid of being mocked and insulted. We shouldn't be afraid of taking a difficult stand for Jesus at work, even though we, we know we're going to face opposition for it. 
We shouldn't be afraid of sharing the gospel. And perhaps if, we, if we're afraid, it's, it's because functionally we, we don't believe that God has the last say. Or it's because we value most acceptance and we fear most rejection. And so we sit down and we keep quiet and, and we try our best to fit in. But Thomas Watson, a, a preacher and author from the 1600s, um, he uses an illustration that goes something uh, like this. You're, you're walking down the street and, and there's, there's a man with a limp and, and he starts laughing at you for walking in a normal way. And then Thomas Watson asks the question, are you then going to start walking with a limp? Are you going to start walking with a limp? And of course we wouldn't. And, and, and the point is, why would we start walking with a limp to fit in? And, and the point is that likewise, when we walk for Jesus, we're going to be laughed at. We're going to be taunted. And it would be equally foolish to be frightened or to bend a culture or to keep quiet and try to fit in and try to do everything else that everyone else is doing Instead, heavenly citizens, don't be frightened by opposition. And finally, Paul says, your suffering is a privilege. Your suffering is a privilege. As a church, we, we know we're walking against the crowd and, and we keep getting bumped about and, and you can't follow Jesus without suffering. And maybe we're through it or we're just fed up and we're not sure it's worth taking a stand for Jesus because when we stand for Jesus, we will suffer for it. But at the end of verse 28, we're, we're assured that God has the last say, salvation will come, opposition will be no more. And now Paul says, your suffering is a privilege. Verse 29, we're reminded that our faith in, in Jesus is a gift that's been granted to us. But notice also our suffering is granted to us, is gifted to us for the sake of Christ. Equally, suffering is a gift we're privileged to receive. But how come? And we understand faith is a gift. Our faith that brings salvation is a gift. We, we no longer trust in our own confidence. We no longer trust in, in our own good intentions. We no longer believe in, in, in working our way to God. And we're no longer insecure. Instead, we rest in Jesus and what he has done. Namely, Jesus, though equal with God, humbled himself and he took on human nature and a servant's role and he humbled himself to death on a, on a cross. He lived the perfect life we could never live and yet he suffered on the cross for our, he suffered our punishment. But for this, he has been highly exalted. His name is the name that is above all every name. This is the gospel. This is the gospel we stand together for and our faith rests on this gospel, on the good news of what Jesus has done. Jesus has done it all and, and so we can't take any credit and we can't even take credit for our faith. Paul says our faith has been granted to us and elsewhere in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 he says for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is a gift of God. We understand our, our faith is a gift. But suffering, how come? Well, the suffering we experience is, is a privilege because it's proof of God's grace at work in us. If we suffer for Jesus, it's a sign that we belong to him. But more than that, when the apostles had, had taken a beating in, in Acts chapter 5, verse 41, you can and look it up in your Bibles at, at, at home, but, but, but in that passage, we're told that, that they were rejoicing, rejoicing because they were worthy to suffer dishonor for Jesus' name. They understood that suffering is a privilege because of who we suffer for. I came across a, a story of a, a, an Indian a Christian lady who grasped this. She suffered at, at the hands of a Hindu extremist group. And 
They threatened to beat any Christians who, who worshipped in, 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 who gathered for worship in their village. And in September 2014, they, they chased her through her village, yelling after her, let's kill her. And when she sought refuge inside her own home, they, they gathered these large stones and, and started to throw them onto the roof, the, the corrugated roof of her, of her home. And eventually the roof collapsed and they beat her and they smashed every possession that she had. And they stole her legal documents and her life savings. But the same woman said this, even if I am beaten, it is all joy. Those of us who were beaten are the privileged ones. So we live for Christ. And when we die, we die for Christ. We have completely given our lives into the hand of Jesus. She said, those of us who were beaten are the privileged ones. She recognized suffering for Jesus is a privilege. She recognizing being, she recognized being considered worthy to suffer for Jesus' name is a privilege. It's a badge of honor. It's a crown for our heads. And it's a crown that we, we share with each other. We're in good company. There's 30. Paul says, you're engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had and, and now hear that I still have. According to Acts 16, they, they experienced opposition because they were accused of disturbing the city. And it sounds familiar Aren't we told that our faith disturbs society? It has no place. And as a result, we face rejection and mockery. But we should know that suffering is a privilege. Because we stand on, on the right side of history with the church and the apostles. And more than that, with Jesus himself. And doesn't Jesus show us that, that the way to glory is through suffering with him? We understand that suffering is a privilege. But then again, if our desire is only for our own glory, we'll never know suffering for Jesus is a privilege. But if our desire is for his glory, then we'll always count suffering, dishonor for Jesus' name, a privilege. Heavenly citizens, your suffering is a privilege. Stand together for the gospel. Don't be frightened by opposition. And finally, your suffering is a privilege. What Paul called the, the church to do was countercultural. Their commitment to Jesus would have bordered treason and, and challenged the so called divinity of Caesar. The church would have been pressurized to conform and, and would have been regarded an embarrassment to society. And not a lot has changed. Still, the church is pressurized to conform our our beliefs are regarded an embarrassment and our commitment to jesus challenges the gods of a secular society but still when the church faces opposition we're to remember our citizenship is in heaven and later in, in chapter 3 verse 20 paul will add we have a citizenship in heaven and we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. And remember this savior who we await lived the way that we're called to. And for us, standing together for the gospel, fearless in the face of opposition and counting all suffering a privilege, it only makes sense in light of what Jesus has done. He stood for the gospel and exposed hearts and people hated him for it. But nevertheless, he was fearless in the face of opposition. He even welcomed the suffering they inflicted on him all for our sake. And now he's been highly exalted. His name is the name above every name. This is the savior we wait for. This is the savior who has gathered us to himself and to each other. This is what he's done for us. And in response, he asks us to, to live worthy lives, to credit the message of the gospel with worthy lives. 
to live as heavenly citizens, fearlessly standing together for his gospel. Amen. And let us join together in prayer. Heavenly Father, we praise you for we know that you are a God who is glorious, who is majestic and mighty. We praise you knowing that you reign and that whatever opposition we face as a church, that nothing can bring down your rule, that nothing can defeat your church. And we thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ who has went before us who suffered and has been now glorified. And we pray that that you would help us to to respond to what he has done for us, to, to stand together fearlessly for the gospel, even in the face of opposition, to be fearless and to proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior of the world. Help us when we are afraid. Help us when we feel weak. Help us to be fearless and to find ways of reaching those around us, those whom we love and know, with the message that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior of the world. In Christ, our Savior's name we pray. Amen. And we've heard God's word, and, and now as we respond to it, let's stand and sing together. I will sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy 
To the only God, our Saviour, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forevermore. Amen.